Alright, now look, this video is all about Nintendo Switch games that I cannot stop playing lately. And I am really excited to make this video because there is a lot of really cool Switch games that just released and I haven't been able to put them down. And as a special treat, if you, if you want to call it that, I do have a really good friend of mine joining this video to give his input on a couple of games I'm talking about today. With all that said, I'm really excited for this video. Let's talk about a bunch of really cool Switch games. If you like this video, or you learn a little something, make sure you smash that like button and please hit flip on that subscribe button with notifications turned on. All right, I think I'm gonna save my absolute favorite game until last, which I think is what you're supposed to do in these kind of videos. And first up, talk about a game I have a lot of opinions on, Team Sonic Racing. I have a love-hate relationship with this game. There's a lot I really love about it, and then there's a lot I really despise about it, if I'm being honest. However, it wouldn't be on this list if I wasn't having a lot of fun with it and playing it a lot. Let's start with the positives. It's called Team Sonic Racing because it incorporates a team racing mode in a way like I've never really seen before. My phone just fell down. Sure, there's been racing games in the past where you race as a team, but typically you're still kind of just flying solo, doing your own thing and racking up points for your team as you play. But in Team Sonic Racing, there's actually a lot of ways to help out your allies as you race. If you see a fellow teammate spinning out of control because he's been hit with the green shell equivalent of whatever is in this game, you can actually give them a little nudge as you drive past and it will give them an acceleration boost and they can get back on their way. It's kind of like playing a shooter game and one of your teammates go down and you stab them in the heart with a syringe of adrenaline so they can get back into the game. And I really like that mechanic and it only starts there. Obviously in this kind of racing game, i.e. a Mario Kart style racing game, you drive through item pickups which will randomize an ability that you can utilize. However, if you get something you don't want, you can actually offer it to your other teammates and they have the choice of accepting that item. And maybe they're in a position where they could actually use the item that you don't want. And on top of that, if you successfully make a trade, you actually build up some of the bar towards your ultimate move thing, which lets you sonic speed, gotta go fast, blast past all the other drivers. Past. I am becoming way too American. Actually, honestly, I'm not even upset about it. God bless America. I love this country. <laughs> and all of this direct team support as you're racing, it's really rewarding, especially when you cross that finish line, assuming that you're all coming in, you know, first, second, third, around that area. It, you feel like, yeah, you really supported each other and you got to that place together. Rather than in other racing games where you just kind of hope that your allies are doing well in the race and there's not much you can do about it other than that. And the racing as a whole is really fun. It's a good, solid race racing game. It runs at 30 frames on the Switch, 60 frames everywhere else. That kind of sucks, not gonna lie, but other than that, it's a very fluid and fast-paced racing game, which is solid. However, I wouldn't say it's the best racing game I've ever played, and it's honestly nowhere near as good as Sonic Racing Transformed. I loved the Sonic Racing Transformed games. It actually took the Mario Kart formula and in a way improved on it. And sure, maybe if you're just hardcore into kart races, car racing games, and you don't care much about boats and planes and that, it might not be for you, but they actually took the base of Mario Kart and in their own way improved on it in another direction and created something new and unique, which was just really fluid, fast, and intense fun, and I loved it. And then they made another one and just stripped out that whole side of it and it became a Mario Kart clone again. That is disappointing, and I don't like that. But the team mechanics did add in something else that was unique and fun, but anything other than the team mode just feels like a very basic carbon copy of a Mario Kart game that's not as good. So for me, if I'm playing Team Sonic Racing, and I have been a lot, it's in the team mode and nothing else. Oh yeah, it can be addicting, and I do recommend the game. Next we have For The King, and I'll be honest, before this game actually released, I knew nothing about it. But I saw this in my local GameStop and it caught my eye immediately. I really love the cover art and the graphical style of the game. Both from the front and back cover, I was very intrigued. I thought, screw it, I'll take the risk and see if I enjoy it. And obviously I did, otherwise I wouldn't be talking about it right now. <laughs> it's kind of like Dungeons and Dragons come to life on a board game. You play with three characters either on your own or you can also play co-op or online. So you have a lot of options. Honestly, kicking off this game, I was very overwhelmed and didn't know if I was going to be able to stick it out. There was just so much going on. There's a lot of depth to this game and it kind of throws it all at you right from the start. In fact, the game even kind of sets you up for that. It tells you expect to die and die again and it might take a while for you to 
to get the hang of it. It's pretty easy to have all three of your characters wiped out and then have to start again. And I came pretty close to that a bunch of times, but fortunately on my first playthrough, I made it pretty far through the game. As long as you only have one or two players knocked out, you can revive them pretty easily. So I just always tried to avoid all of them being dead. I ran away at the last second if I needed to. But again, once you get stuck into the game and really get a feel for all of it, it becomes addictive fast, just like any good board game. And I mentioned D&D earlier, and that's because everything you do in the game is decided by essentially a roll of the dice. Whether it's moving across the board or attacking an enemy. Depending on the weapon, you'll have to get X amount of positive rolls or slots or whatever you want to call them to do good damage or do any damage or not miss. Imagine like telling your D&D dungeon master you want to attack X thing and then he rolls the dice and he's like, oh, you miss. It's kind of like that, but you can cheat it a little bit. You have what the game calls focus points and you can actually use those at any point for anything that involves a roll of the die or chance to kind of just go, oh yeah, that one's fine. But you don't get many of these focus points and it does take a lot of effort to recharge them. So you have to use them sparingly and in the right place. If I was down to one character, I would use all my focus points to make sure my attacks were going to land. Obviously the cooler and stronger weapons that have more effects to them you're gonna need better chances and more rolls to actually land the hit. And the entire game, in my opinion, is gorgeous. I don't know what you call this art style. It kind of looks like everything is made out of model clay. I'm sure there's an actual term for this look and I'll try and find it. But all I know is it really worked for this board game aesthetic. It's definitely a very slow paced game, but that's what works so well for the Switch. Because at any point during playing, if you have to take a break, you just put your Switch to sleep and then, you know, days later you come back to it, turn that bad boy on and knock out a couple of turns and then back to sleep if you have to do something else. With it being roguelike, obviously every time you start the game up, it's gonna be a different layout, where the towns are, where the missions are. And then as you're playing, it continues to throw more things at you too, like different enemies will randomly pop up, or shrines where you can take your chance to earn experience or gold, dungeons in different places. The dungeon crawling was actually pretty fun. You go to the nearest town first, stock up on items, abilities, and weapons, whatever it is you need for this crawl. And then you go and throw yourself into this dungeon and just wave and wave and wave after enemies until you get to the boss. You always get really cool drops and good loot. Go back to the town, heal up, get another mission to go and complete somewhere in the world and keep following along the main story as you go. It's so easy to sink a lot of time into this game as you build your own adventure. And again, just because of the nature of the game, it's easy to knock out a bunch of turns and then put the game away for a few days while you play something else and then pick it back up again. So games that are addictive, ones that you can stop playing, they're usually games like the ones I've talked about so far. They don't really have an ending to them. But that doesn't mean that you can't get addicted to games that do end. And the next couple are those kind of games. Story-driven games on the Switch that as soon as I started playing, I needed to hit those end credits before I played anything else because I was just so invested. And uh, I'm gonna be talking about Resident Evil 4 because I finally, for the first time ever, played through that game. And I have, oh, some things to say about it. <laughs> and then the next one is Assassin's Creed 3. And again, while I have it on Switch, I've been really enjoying it. I wouldn't say that I was addicted to it, but my friend RGT85 was. He even made a video about it, which you can go and watch, or if you're too lazy, Let's just hear what he has to say about it right now. <laughs> when you ask most people what the worst Assassin's Creed game is, usually they say Assassin's Creed 3. And after playing and enjoying Assassin's Creed 1 and 2, I never got around to playing Assassin's Creed 3, and then all the negative stigma around the game just sort of turned me off. I didn't play Assassin's Creed 3 until the remastered edition came out on the Nintendo Switch, and I ended up being absolutely blown away by this game. I made a video saying that I was addicted to it, and I meant it. That game is absolutely fantastic once it starts to get into motion. You see, the problem the problem with Assassin's Creed 3, I feel, is the first few acts of the game can definitely be a bit off-putting. The character you play as isn't really all that interesting, and it doesn't really seem that much different than the first two Assassin's Creed games, just in a different setting. But once you start to play as the main character in the game, which happens around Act 5 of the game, the game really starts to open up. You're doing a whole bunch of different stuff that you did not do in its previous Assassin's Creed games. There's things like hunting, there's things like crossing over areas in horseback, a lot of different mission types and variety varieties out there. I think this game really stands out. It's not the most technically impressive game on the Switch. There is instances of slowdown. Sometimes characters will just pop up out of nowhere as well. But really, it's just such a fun game at its core once it finally starts 
to open up, considering the fact that it also includes a PSP exclusive Assassin's Creed game on this cartridge as well, there's a lot of value to be had here. I've been having a blast with Assassin's Creed 3, and I'll continue to have a blast with Assassin's Creed 3. Definitely a highly recommended game, and a game that I've been playing a lot and really enjoying. But I want to talk about Resident Evil 4. <laughs> And I've been pumped to talk about this game because, again, it was my first ever playthrough from start to finish, and yeah, this game's really good. Everyone was right. It's literally been ported to every single system since the GameCube, and I've never really given it a chance since then. I played it initially back when it came out on the GameCube, and I went, this isn't Resident Evil. I had just come from the first game and the second game. Admittedly, I did skip the third game and I went to the fourth game and I just, I couldn't get into it. I never even got to actually saving Ashley the first time, which is only a couple hours into the game, which just goes to show that I, yeah, I didn't really give this game a chance. Everyone was talking about how terrible it controlled and I downloaded it because of that. I wanted to play it for myself, see how bad it was. And if it was that bad, it would have been a real easy video to make. This this game is terrible on Switch, you know, those videos always do well. But as I played it, I didn't see the issue. They didn't implement motion controls, would have been nice, the Wii U had them, and I do agree, the Switch should have had them too. But I mean, playing this game like you would play any other game on the Switch without motion controls, I did not have an issue. It's not a good control scheme, that's why they fixed it. But I'm used to it. And I liked it. <laughs> this is a fantastic Resident Evil game. No, it's not like the earlier ones. It is more action. It didn't go all the way action like Resident Evil 5 did. There were some creepy moments spliced into it, like near the end with those zombies where you had to shoot little squid things off their bodies. I hated the sound they made. As soon as I walked into a room and I heard them grunting down a hallway, I felt tense and uneasy on edge. I didn't want to walk down that hallway and find that creepy thing down there. But yeah, for the most part, it was an action game and nowhere near as creepy as the previous titles. But the action was packed. There was something new happening behind every door. Some kind of new enemy or challenge or boss or puzzle to figure out. Leon sucks at taking care of Ashley. He lost her like seven times throughout the playthrough. But it always added to the intensity of the story and needing to get back to her to save her once again. Thought it was hilarious that at the end of the game, after going through all of this, Ashley tries to hit on Leon and then and Leon hardcore shuts her down. <laughs> so, uh, after you take me back to my place, how about we do some, um, overtime? <laughs> Sorry. And yeah, it was a really fun game that I couldn't put down. For like a week straight, every time I had time to play a game, I was really excited to pick up my Switch and progress more through Resident Evil 4. And what I just really appreciated about my time playing this game is that usually when you go back and you play these retro classics, you kind of get the feeling for what it would have been like playing it at the time. And you can see, oh yeah, this would have been epic at the time. But Res 4, I enjoyed today. I enjoyed now in 2019. A lot of people call this game a timeless classic and I absolutely agree because I played it now in 2019 and it is a classic. I loved it. I highly recommend picking this one up and don't be deterred just because everyone said it was terrible. Yeah, there's no motion controls, but other than that, it plays the same as anywhere else. Okay, my favorite game on this list is by far, well and truly, really easily, Cadence of Hyrule, and I'm sure you saw this coming because I'm sure I stuck it into the thumbnail. Love this freaking game. The developers behind Crypt of the Necro Dancer, they did a fantastic job at taking their game and just reskinning it. You know what? No, I'm not even gonna say the words reskinning because it was its own thing. Like, I don't think Nintendo themselves could have done an any better job at taking the Zelda franchise and developing a game in that universe that you played to music. Other than that one mechanic, this game felt like a brand new Zelda game. That's something that I never knew I wanted, a roguelike Zelda game. In fact, you can even turn off the playing to music side of this game and play the game like a roguelike Zelda Link to the Past. I mean, I love Link to the Past because in my opinion, it is a near perfect game. That is structured in just the right way to give you a tailored Zelda experience that is perfect from start to finish. However, I would also like the ability to turn on a roguelike mode for Zelda Link to the Past, and every time I started the game, all the dungeons, all the items, all the abilities were in different places, so it felt fresh every time, and that is what Cadence of Hyrule is, just played to music, unless you turn off the music, but I don't know why you would, because that gameplay mechanic itself is not only very addicting, but the music, oh my word, the music is gorgeous. It's that original Zelda music we already know and 
love, but played with some badass electric guitar. So if you haven't played this game or you haven't played Crypto the Necro Dancer, let me explain it. I've already kind of talked about the Zelda side of it. Imagine, again, Link to the Past, where every time you play, everything's in different locations, and every action you make has to be in tune with the beat. So every time you take a step, every time you pick up an item, every time you attack an enemy, it all has to be on the beat. And it's really cool. You get into a rhythm, you get into a flow. Every enemy has their own distinct attack pattern, and even when you have a ton of enemies on the screen that would otherwise be very overwhelming in any other game, you can really move around this board like you're reading the Matrix and kill everything without taking a hit of damage. Or if you're like me, you end up getting hit a lot anyway, but I still manage to make it out of most fights okay. And it's so addicting because of the replay value. Actually, speaking of, the reason why I finished it so many times, other than I was just really enjoying it, is because the first time I finished it, I blitz through it in like five hours. And I was like, oh, that's kind of a short game. Um, and then I found out that Sean, who you've seen in this video, the first time he played, he finished it in 26 hours. Because he probably got a challenging configuration. Everything was probably put in awkward places and it just took him a lot longer to solve the puzzles because of the order the puzzles were given to him in. Maybe I just got lucky and everything fell into place perfectly and I just hit everything in the right order. So I tried again to see if I did it around the same time, less, more, and my second playthrough, I shaved off two hours of my time and finished it in three. And at that point, I felt like I could do it even quicker than that, so I live-streamed my own challenge of can I beat it in three hours, and with the help of some of you, I finished it in just over two hours. I was really happy with that. But at that point, I had developed a bunch of strategies, I knew the game pretty well inside and out, I wasn't worried too much about clearing the screens of enemies, I was just kind of blitzing through and looking for certain things that I knew I needed, and I would say an average playthrough is pretty probably around 8 to 10 hours unless, again, you either get lucky or you've had experience with Crypto the Necro Dancer, because that did help for me. And I'm absolutely not done with this one. I finished it three times already, and I'm sure I'll finish it three times more and then some. It feels like a long time since I actually got to stand here and talk about a bunch of really cool Switch games I've been playing. I hope you found a bunch of games that you can't wait to go and buy and play. Let me know which ones you liked below, or even what games you can't stop playing down below. Huge thank you to Sean for helping out in this video, and a huge thank Thank you to you guys for putting up with Sean. I know it's not easy. Smash like if you enjoyed this video or you learned a little something. As I said earlier, hit a flip on that subscribe button. So I'm just going to end the video. Okay, bye.